Welcome to UFO Mysteries at Nightfall, your gateway to the mysteries of the universe. I'm your host, Henry Thornton. In this episode, we will be bringing you two brand new tales of encounters with the ethereal. First, we will hear about the shocking events that occurred one September 1961 evening in Lancaster, New Hampshire, when Barney and Betty Hill were abducted by aliens. Later on in the show, we will delve into the fascinating case of the Phoenix Lights, when there were multiple reports from all over the city and surrounding areas of strange lights in the sky. These are two UFO stories that you definitely do not want to miss. And now, Case 6. The Abduction of Betty and Barney Hill. Lancaster, New Hampshire, September 19, 1961. 10.30 p.m. The first of today's cases concerns one of the best-known alien abduction cases in history. This event took place on September 19, 1961, and would quickly become one of the most believable cases of alien abduction ever recorded. So, as always, step into the unknown with UFO Mysteries at Nightfall, where mysteries unfold in the vast expanse above. Together, let's uncover the alien enigma. Barney and Betty Hill made their home in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Barney, employed by the United States Postal Service, shared his life with Betty, formerly Eunice Barrett, a dedicated social worker. Engaged members of the local Unitarian congregation, the Hills were not only active in their community, but also held leadership roles in the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Barney, in particular, served on a local board of the United States Commission on Civil Rights. Their union was notably interracial, a rarity at the time, with Barney being black and Betty being white. It's worth noting that the Hill's legacy extends to being the grandparents of Angela Hill, the current UFC strawweight fighter. September 19, 1961. 10.30 p.m. Barney and Betty had enjoyed a vacation in Niagara Falls in Montreal and now were headed home to Portsmouth. It was a dark, calm, cool autumnal evening and the pair drove along the empty mountain road chatting and listening to the radio in their 57 Chevy Bel Air. The pair found themselves just south of Lancaster, New Hampshire when Betty noticed a luminous point in the sky, initially dismissing it as a falling star until it moved upward in an erratic manner. Intrigued by the unusual behavior and its increasing size and brightness, Betty persuaded Barney to pull over at a scenic picnic area near Twin Mountain to get a closer look and walk their dog, Delcy. Using binoculars, Betty saw an unusual aircraft flying overhead. It had multicolored lights and was flying across the face of the moon. Barney initially brushed it off as a commercial airliner. This was before he observed the object descending and heading straight towards him. Realizing it wasn't an ordinary plane, Barney became captivated as the object, silent and illuminated, maneuvered erratically near Cannon Mountain. Continuing their slow drive through Franconia Notch to observe the approaching object, the hills claimed it passed landmarks, including a restaurant and signal tower on Cannon Mountain, and appeared near the old man of the mountain. Betty estimated its size to be at least one and a half times the length of the granite cliff profile, describing a seemingly rotating craft. The couple witnessed its erratic movements as it bounced across the night sky. Approximately one mile south of Indian Head, the object rapidly descended toward their vehicle, prompting Barney to halt in the middle of the highway. The enormous, silent craft hovered about 80 to 100 feet above their car, filling the entire windshield view. Barney, carrying his pistol, approached the object. Barney claimed that when looking through the binoculars, he could see somewhere between 8 and 11 mysterious figures peering out of the craft's windows. These figures, which were small with gray skin, large heads and big eyes, moved in unison, except for one who continued observing Barney and conveyed a message to him telling him to remain in place and keep watching. Barney recalled their glossy black uniforms and caps, and as red lights extended from the sides, a long structure descended from below the craft. The craft approached to an estimated 50 to 80 feet overhead and 300 feet away from Barney. On October 21, 1961, he reported to NICAP investigator Walter Webb that the beings were somehow not human. Upon arriving home around dawn, the Hills experienced some rather strange occurrences that couldn't be explained easily. 
Betty insisted on keeping their luggage near the back door rather than in the main part of the house. Curiously, both of their watches ceased to function. Barney noticed the leather strap for the binoculars was torn, a detail he couldn't recall. The toes of his best dress shoes showed signs of scraping, and, as a result of an inexplicable compulsion, Barney found himself examining his genitals in the bathroom, discovering nothing amiss. To eliminate potential contamination, they took extended showers and each sketched a representation of their observed UFO. Baffled by these occurrences, the Hills attempted to reconstruct the timeline of events surrounding the UFO sighting and their journey home. However, immediately after hearing buzzing sounds, their memories became fragmented and incomplete. After a few hours of sleep, Betty awoke and placed the clothing and shoes worn during the drive into her closet. Notably, the dress was torn at the hem, zipper, and lining. Later, upon retrieval, she discovered a pinkish powder on the dress. Hanging it on the clothesline, the powder dissipated, but the dress sustained irreparable damage. Although initially discarded, Betty retrieved and stored the dress, and over the years, five separate laboratories conducted chemical and forensic analysis on it. Further anomalies emerged, including shiny, concentric circles on their car's trunk that were absent the previous day. Experimenting with a compass, Betty and Barney observed rapid whirling when moved close to the circles, while the needle dropped when inches away from the shiny spots. Walter N. Webb, an astronomer from Boston, and a member of NICAP, engaged in a comprehensive six-hour interview with the Hills on October 21, 1961. During this extensive session, the Hills recounted all the details they could recall from their UFO encounter. Barney expressed a perceived mental block, suspecting that there were aspects of the event he intentionally suppressed. Despite this, he provided a detailed account of the craft and the appearance of the somehow-not-human figures on board. After interviewing the couple, Webb was of the opinion that the Hills were truthful, and the incident likely unfolded precisely as reported. He acknowledged minor uncertainties and technicalities inherent in such observations, considering factors like exact time, length of visibility, apparent sizes, and distances, all subject to human judgment. Following the alleged UFO encounter, Betty began experiencing a series of vivid dreams ten days later, persisting for five consecutive nights. These dreams, exceptionally detailed and intense, ceased after the fifth night but remained a lingering presence in her thoughts. When she initially shared them with Barney, he was sympathetic but not overly concerned, and the matter was not revisited. In November 1961, Betty started documenting the dream details. In one dream, she and Barney encountered a roadblock with men surrounding their car. Losing consciousness briefly, Betty found herself compelled by two small men to walk in a forest at night. In the dream, she saw Barney seemingly in a trance or sleepwalking behind her. The small men, about five feet tall, donned matching blue uniforms and caps resembling those worn by military cadets. Despite their nearly human appearance with black hair, dark eyes, prominent noses, and bluish lips, their grayish-colored skin hinted at an otherworldly nature. In the dream, Betty and Barney were brought back to their car, where the leader suggested they wait to witness the craft's departure. After doing so, they resumed their drive home. Having perused Webb's initial report, Jackson and Homan sought clarification from the Hills, focusing on the duration of their trip. Although the Hills noted arriving home later than expected for the 178-mile journey, they were oblivious to the fact that it took them seven hours from departure in Colebrook. When this discrepancy was pointed out, termed missing time by ufologists, the Hills had no explanation. Recollections of the 35 miles on U.S. Route 3 between Lincoln, Indian Head, and Ashland were nearly non-existent, save for an image of a fiery orb on the ground, initially thought to be the moon, which had already set earlier in the evening. In order to try and possibly uncover memories of the night, memories which might have been lost or suppressed, it was suggested that hypnosis might be helpful. While Barney hesitated, considering it might help Betty dispel what he regarded as nonsense about her dreams, they decided to explore this avenue. In a private disclosure on November 23, 1962, at their church's parsonage, the Hills shared their encounter with Captain Ben H. Sweat of the United States Air Force, who was a guest speaker. Intrigued by the missing time aspect, the Hills asked if Sweat would hypnotize them to recover memories. Sweat declined, cautioning against amateur hypnotists. 
The Hills agreed that it might be rather foolish to rely upon an amateur, so they looked to find a professional and quickly enlisted the services of Benjamin Simon. During Simon's hypnosis sessions, Barney, consistent with his conscious recall, reported the binocular strap breaking as he ran from the UFO. Driving away, he felt compelled to pull off the road into the woods, where he encountered six men on a dirt road. The car stalled and three men approached, staring into his eyes with a mesmerizing effect. Describing their eyes in terrifying detail, Barney noted a feeling of their eyes pressing against his. While Betty recalled a conversation with the leader in English, Barney heard them speaking in an unintelligible language. The communication, according to Barney, seemed to involve thought transference, a concept unfamiliar to him at the time as he had not yet encountered the term telepathy. Betty's sessions under hypnosis mirrored her five dreams about the UFO abduction, but with notable differences, particularly in the details of her capture and release. Discrepancies extended to the technology on the craft, the distinct physical appearance of the short men, and alterations in the sequential order of the abduction. Despite these variations, both Barney's and Betty's memories during hypnotic regression remained consistent with each other. Upon completing the series of hypnosis sessions, Simon penned an article for the journal Psychiatric Opinion, asserting that the Hills case was a unique psychological aberration. Following the hypnosis sessions, the Hills returned to their normal lives. While they were open to discussing the alleged UFO encounter with friends, family, and occasional UFO researchers, they did not actively seek publicity. However, on October 25, 1965, the Boston Traveler featured a front-page story titled UFO Chiller, Did They Seize Couple? Reporter John H. Luttrell claimed to have obtained an audio tape recording of a lecture the Hills delivered in Quincy Center in late 1963. Luttrell learned about the Hill's hypnosis with Simon and acquired notes from confidential interviews with UFO investigators. On October 26, United Press International picked up Luttrell's story, thrusting the Hills into international attention. In 1966, writer John G. Fuller collaborated with the Hills and Simon to publish the book The Interrupted Journey, which quickly became a success, undergoing multiple printings. The book included a copy of Betty's sketch of the star map. Barney passed away from a cerebral hemorrhage on February 25, 1969, at the age of 46. Betty, having become a celebrity in the UFO community, lived the remainder of her life without remarrying and succumbed to cancer on October 17, 2004, at the age of 85. Interpreting the Star Map in 1968, Marjorie Fish, an elementary school teacher and amateur astronomer from Oak Harbor, Ohio, read John G. Fuller's book, Interrupted Journey, which chronicled the Hill's UFO encounter. Captivated by Betty Hill's purported alien star map, Fish sought to decipher its meaning and identify the star system from which the UFO might hail. Fish, assuming that one of the 15 stars on the map represented Earth's sun, meticulously constructed a three-dimensional model of nearby sun-like stars. Utilizing thread and beads, she based stellar distances on information from the 1969 Gliese Star Catalog. After years of studying thousands of vantage points, Fish found that the viewpoint of the double star system, Zeta Reticuli, approximately 39 light-years from Earth, matched the hill map. Fish shared her analysis with Walter N. Webb, who concurred with her conclusions. Webb, in turn, forwarded the map to Terence Dickinson, the editor of Astronomy magazine. Although Dickinson didn't endorse Fish and Webb's findings, the magazine for the first time invited comments and debate on a UFO report in its December 1974 issue. In the early 1990s, the European Hipparchos mission provided more accurate measurements of star distances around the Sun, challenging Fish's interpretation. Some stars in her map were found to be farther away than initially thought and the criteria she used to identify life-supporting stars had inconsistencies. Ultimately, Fish rejected her hypothesis in a public statement. Interrupted Journey, published in 1966 by John G. Fuller, Interrupted Journey extensively details the Hill's claims. Excerpts from the book were featured in Look Magazine. Captured the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience, authored by Betty Hill's niece Kathleen Marden and scientist Stanton T. Friedman, further explores Fuller's themes. Analysis by Jim McDonald, a resident of the area where the Hills claim to be abducted, offers a compelling alternative perspective. 
McDonald's detailed investigation suggests that the episode might have been triggered by the Hills misinterpreting an aircraft warning beacon on Cannon Mountain as a UFO. From the road they traveled, the beacon's appearance and disappearance align precisely with the Hills' descriptions of the UFO's appearance and disappearance. McDonald attributes the rest of the experience to stress, sleep deprivation, and false memories that were recovered during hypnosis. UFO expert Robert Schieffer underscores the significance of not driving while sleep-deprived, suggesting that the hills are emblematic of this concern. While it is indeed correct that you should not drive if you have not had enough sleep, it is not true to say that being tired will lead you to believe that you were abducted by aliens and taken to their home planet to be probed and examined. In fact, it really is quite preposterous. In a 1990 article titled Entirely Unpredisposed, Martin Kottmeyer proposed that Barney Hill's memories, revealed during hypnosis, might have been influenced by The Bellero Shield, an episode of The Outer Limits aired on February 10, 1964, approximately two weeks before Barney's initial hypnotic session. The TV episode featured an extraterrestrial with large wraparound eyes and a line resembling Barney's later regression report. Kottmeyer noted the striking visual resemblance suggesting a potential cultural influence. Despite a different researcher asking Betty about the outer limits, she claimed to have never heard of it. Kottmeyer also highlighted motifs similar to the 1953 film, Invaders from Mars. In the realm of nonfiction, Barney Hill appeared on To Tell the Truth in an episode aired on December 12, 1966. Betty Hill's niece, Kathleen Martin, along with ufologist Stanton Friedman, authored Captured in 2004, delving into the case. The 2023 Dark Horse comic series Blue Book 1961 presents a fact-based account blending historical events with artistic interpretation. Various fictional portrayals have surfaced in popular media. The film The UFO Incident dramatizes the Hill's abduction, with James Earl Jones and Estelle Parsons playing the couple. The 1996 television series Dark Skies featured Basil Wallace and Lee Garlington as the Hills. UFO lore, including the Betty and Barney Hill incident, is integrated into the comic book series Saucer Country by Paul Cornell. In 2018, the Dinner Party virtual reality exhibit at Wonderspaces explored the story. The 2019 Project Blue Book episode Abduction on the History Channel delves into the Betty and Barney Hill UFO incident. Angelo D'Augustine's 2023 album Toil and Trouble includes the track The Ballad of Betty and Barney Hill. Narrating the incident from an alien perspective, traveling through the White Mountains to Zeta Reticuli. Case 7. The Phoenix Lights UFO Incident, Arizona and Nevada. March 13, 1997. Phoenix is the capital and largest city of Arizona, located in the southwestern United States. The city is situated in the Salt River Valley, or the Valley of the Sun, surrounded by several mountain ranges including the McDowell Mountains to the northeast and the White Tank Mountains to the west. The cityscape features a mix of modern high-rise buildings, suburban neighborhoods, and desert landscapes. The climate in Phoenix is characterized by extremely hot summers with temperatures often exceeding 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 38 degrees Celsius, and mild winters. The city experiences abundant sunshine throughout the year, contributing to its nickname as the Valley of the Sun. The desert surroundings showcase iconic saguaro cacti, Joshua trees, and various other types of desert vegetation. The Sonoran Desert, where Phoenix is located, is known for its unique flora and fauna adapted to arid conditions. The city has a vibrant cultural scene with numerous museums, galleries, and theaters. The Heard Museum, for example, is renowned for its collection of Native American art and artifacts. Additionally, the Desert Botanical Garden showcases the diverse plant life native to the region. Phoenix is also a hub for outdoor activities, offering opportunities for hiking, golfing, and other recreational pursuits. Popular outdoor destinations include Camelback Mountain, South Mountain Park, and Papago Park. The city has a diverse population, 
and its cultural influences are reflected in the culinary scene, which features a mix of southwestern, Mexican, and international cuisines. Phoenix is also known for its sports culture, with professional teams like the Phoenix Suns NBA and Arizona Cardinals NFL. Overall, Phoenix combines the amenities of a major metropolitan area with the unique beauty of the surrounding desert landscape, creating a distinctive and dynamic urban environment. Now put yourself in the shoes of one of the residents and imagine how it would feel to witness a UFO from another planet or dimension in the sky above you. How do you think you would react? What would it be like? As the night settled over the city of Phoenix here is how I imagine it would be. I found myself standing in awe on my front porch, my gaze fixed upon an otherworldly display that defied everything I thought I knew. The air charged with an eerie anticipation as I witnessed the mysterious Phoenix lights unfold before my disbelieving eyes. The first inkling of something extraordinary came as an immense V-shaped formation materialized in the night sky. Glowing orbs, like celestial lanterns, cast an ethereal glow against the darkness. They moved in unison, silent and majestic, creating a surreal spectacle that left me breathless. The lights, each a pulsating orb of luminescence, seemed to defy the laws of physics as they floated in perfect formation. It was as if the heavens themselves were unveiling a secret, and I, an unsuspecting witness, was granted a glimpse into the unknown. As the massive mothership craft traversed the horizon, it blocked out the stars, casting an enigmatic shadow upon the landscape below. The city below remained oblivious to the cosmic phenomenon unfolding above, while I stood frozen, my senses overwhelmed by the magnitude of what I was witnessing. In that moment, a profound sense of humility and insignificance washed over me. The lights, with their inexplicable dance, sparked a realization that our understanding of the universe was merely a fraction of its vast mysteries. A silent communion seemed to transpire between me and the enigmatic visitors from Planet Unknown. The experience left an indelible mark on my soul, igniting a curiosity that transcended the boundaries of terrestrial understanding. In the subsequent days, as I recounted my encounter, I struggled to find words to convey the ethereal beauty and the sense of connection with the cosmic unknown. For me, the Phoenix Lights were not merely a celestial event. They were a doorway to a realm of possibilities beyond our comprehension. The idea that I had witnessed a visitation from extraterrestrial beings lingered in my thoughts, leaving me forever changed by the haunting beauty of that inexplicable night. The Phoenix Lights, also known as the Lights Over Phoenix, marked a series of widely observed unidentified flying objects in the skies over Arizona and Nevada on March 13, 1997. The sightings occurred between 7.30 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. MST, spanning approximately 300 miles from the Nevada border through Phoenix to the outskirts of Tucson. Numerous witnesses, including actor Kurt Russell, reported lights of varying descriptions, with some describing a large carpenter's square-shaped UFO containing five spherical lights. The incident involved two distinct events, a triangular formation of lights passing over the state and a set of stationary lights in the Phoenix area. On the evening of March 13, 1997, various sightings of unusual lights were reported in the southwestern states. In Henderson, Nevada, at 7.55 p.m. MST, a witness observed a large V-shaped object moving southeast. Around 8.15 p.m., a former police officer in Paulden, Arizona, reported a cluster of reddish-orange lights disappearing over the southern horizon. Subsequent reports emerged from Prescott Valley, Arizona, with Tim Lay, his wife Bobby, son Hal, and grandson Damian Turnage witnessing the lights from approximately 65 miles away. Initially appearing as five distinct lights in an arc resembling a balloon, the lights seemed to approach the observers. Over the next ten minutes, they transformed into an upside-down V-shape as they drew closer. At a distance of a few miles, the family discerned a shape resembling a 60-degree carpenter's square, with five lights embedded, one at the front and two on each side. The object, accompanied by the lights, approached them slowly, hovering silently about 100 to 150 feet above, passing over their heads and moving towards Pistua Peak Mountain and Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport. Another witness said that the craft was bigger than a football field and hovered low above houses and silently moved over the neighborhood. Between 8.30 and 8.45 p.m., witnesses in Glendale, a suburb northwest of Phoenix, observed the light formation passing overhead at a high altitude, eventually obscured by thin clouds. 
Amateur astronomer Mitch Stanley in Scottsdale, Arizona, viewed the lights through a telescope, identifying them as individual planes. Around 10 p.m., numerous people in the Phoenix area reported seeing a row of brilliant lights hovering in the sky or slowly falling. This event led to the capture of various photographs and videos, earning it a description by author Robert Schieffer as perhaps the most widely witnessed UFO event in history. In response to the incident, Arizona Governor Fife Symington III held a press conference shortly afterward, playfully claiming that they found who was responsible and unveiling an aide dressed in an alien costume. However, in 2007, Symington reportedly disclosed to a UFO investigator that he had a personal close encounter with an alien spacecraft, but chose to remain silent because he didn't want to panic the populace. Symington, being a pilot familiar with various flying machines, described the unidentified craft as larger than anything he had ever seen, emphasizing that other responsible individuals also witnessed it. He expressed confusion over why some people would ridicule the mysterious event. In 2007, observers reported lights which were recorded by the local Fox News television station on February 6th. According to military officials and the FAA, these lights were identified as flares dropped by F-16 Fighting Falcon aircraft during training at Luke Air Force Base. In 2008, on April 21st, residents of Phoenix reported lights that seemingly transformed from a square to a triangular formation over time. A Valley resident mentioned that after the lights appeared, three jets were spotted heading west toward them. An official from Luke AFB denied any U.S. Air Force activity in the area. So what exactly was the cause of these lights in the sky? There are numerous explanations and arguments on both sides. Let's take a look at some of them now. Firstly, let's look at the arguments which suggest the lights were of extraterrestrial origin, the unconventional flight patterns. Witnesses reported that the lights exhibited unconventional flight patterns inconsistent with typical aircraft or celestial phenomena. Some described the lights as forming a triangular shape hovering and then moving silently across the sky. These characteristics are sometimes associated with UFO sightings. The sheer size and brightness. Some witnesses describe the lights as massive and intensely bright. The sheer size and luminosity of the reported objects led some to speculate that the lights were beyond the scale of conventional aircraft or human-made technology. Then there are the multiple sightings. The Phoenix lights were observed by thousands of people across a significant geographical area. The widespread and simultaneous nature of the sightings suggested a singular, large-scale event, which some argue is more consistent with an extraterrestrial phenomenon than a human-made one. Despite official attempts to explain the event as military flares or other mundane phenomena, critics argue that these explanations do not account for all aspects of the sightings. The lack of a clear and universally accepted explanation fuels the extraterrestrial hypothesis. The video quality of the Phoenix Lights UFO sightings in 1997 was relatively poor. Most of the available footage from that night consists of amateur videos shot using handheld camcorders. During that time, consumer video technology was not as advanced as it is today, and the low-light capabilities of consumer-grade cameras were limited. The recorded videos generally show a series of lights in the night sky, forming a triangular or V-shaped pattern. However, due to the low resolution and quality of the equipment used, the details of the objects remain unclear. The lights appear as indistinct bright points against the dark sky. It's important to note that the quality of the footage, combined with the distance and altitude of the lights, contributes to the challenge of definitively identifying the objects. Critics argue that the lack of clear details in the videos makes it difficult to draw conclusions about the nature of the lights, whether they were military flares, aircraft, or, as some suggest, extraterrestrial in origin. While the Phoenix Lights incident remains a subject of debate and intrigue, the limitations of the video footage have been a factor in the ongoing ambiguity surrounding the event. Now let's look at arguments suggesting military involvement. Firstly, let's consider the flare drop explanation. The U.S. Air Force initially claimed responsibility for the lights, stating that they were military flares dropped during a training exercise. Flares can explain the slow descent and illumination observed by some witnesses, and the government's official stance maintains that the lights were flares, and it was reiterated in later years. However, one factor should be taken into consideration here. One witness, who was interviewed for the TV show Unsolved Mysteries, 
was a commercial airline pilot with over 29 years' experience. This man gave an account of how he witnessed the Phoenix lights from on the ground, and not once did it cross his mind that these lights were as a result of flares having been dropped. And there were a couple of reasons for this, first of all, due to his experience as a pilot. The witness had seen aerial flares in the sky on numerous occasions. He had seen them from on the ground and from inside a plane as he was flying. And these lights did not resemble flares in any way, shape, or form. The witness then went on to say that there was a simpler reason he knew that they were not military flares. They are dangerous. The military would not be so incompetent as to release numerous flares over a population center. In summary, the debate over the Phoenix Lights remains unsolved, with believers in extraterrestrial origins highlighting the unusual characteristics of the sightings, while those favoring a military explanation point to the official admission of flare exercises and the consistent behavior of such drops. So as we gaze upon the vastness of the night sky, a question that has captivated human minds for centuries echoes in the chambers of our collective curiosity. Are we alone in the universe? The existence of extraterrestrial life, a concept woven into the fabric of science fiction, has long fueled the imagination. Yet, as we ponder the cosmic mysteries surrounding the existence of aliens, we find ourselves standing at the intersection of wonder and uncertainty. The sheer vastness of the cosmos, with its countless galaxies and trillions of stars, hints at the possibility that the conditions for life may exist elsewhere. Scientific endeavors, such as the search for exoplanets in the habitable zone, tantalize us with the prospect of discovering worlds that could harbor life forms beyond our understanding. The question lingers. If the universe is teeming with potential abodes, where are our cosmic neighbors? Where are the aliens? One perspective suggests that the vast distances between celestial bodies act as cosmic barriers, hindering direct contact between civilizations. The enormity of interstellar space poses formidable challenges, even for the most advanced hypothetical extraterrestrial societies. Could it be that, like us, they grapple with the vastness of space, rendering meaningful encounters an elusive dream? Alternatively, some theories propose that we might have already encountered extraterrestrial beings, but our limited human comprehension has obscured these interactions. Are they observing us discreetly, hidden within the cosmic tapestry? Or have they made fleeting appearances, leaving only cryptic imprints on our collective consciousness? As we consider these ethereal musings, the possible outcomes of contact with extraterrestrial intelligence emerge as intriguing scenarios. The spectrum ranges from the benevolent sharing of knowledge, potentially propelling humanity into a new era of understanding, to the unsettling prospect of unintended consequences and existential challenges. Will they be able to tell us how the world was created once and for all, and what the meaning of life is? Or will they simply destroy us and our entire planet for our natural resources? In the episodes to come, we'll continue our journey into the realms of the unknown, unraveling UFO and alien mysteries that defy explanation. And, as always, keep looking up to the skies and never stop searching for the truth.